So our next storyteller, Rashida. Uh, this is her first time on our stage, although she's told stories before and she's had a very story rich life. Anyway, she went on this romantic getaway to Mexico and it turned south and by the time she came back, she felt like she was suffocating. Please give it up for Rashida and her story, Tale from the Tenderloin. <laughs> In 1972, I came to San Francisco with my boyfriend, Joe. We were in our early 20s. We actually lived at 375 Eddy Street, not far from here. We stayed there for a year without a television. We read books and listened to uh, K-San. And by 1973, for some reason, one evening, he said, let's go to Mexico. I'm like, OK. <laughs> so we packed up our little belongings and made our way to the border. They weren't going to let me in because I was unemployed. But he said he was a writer, so they said I was his secretary. So that's how I got into Mexico. We had a wonderful time. I found out black people do get sunburned. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, the only Mexican language, I, all I had to know was dos cerveza, por favor, <laughs> which still gets me over to this day. So <laughs> we're having this great time burning up in the heat. And um, one evening, he just said, I don't want to do this anymore. And he broke up with me. So I came back to, he gave me most of our money. It was his money, because I was unemployed. He gave me all the money, kept enough to get back to the East Coast. And here I was in the Tenderloin alone. I had no friends, no family. Everyone was 3,000 miles away. And I wasn't, I hadn't bonded with his friends who were all like ex-Vietnam alcoholic dope addicts. <laughs> and writers, they were very creative, but they were insane. <laughs> so I embarked on this journey of survival without knowing anyone. I'm pretty good with money, so I figured I'll get an inexpensive hotel room and I'll figure things out from there. So I'm figuring things out. And as I'm figuring things out, the money is going down. All I'm doing with the money is paying the little rent and eating. Meanwhile, all I have is my few clothes from Mexico, which included my hirachis, which were falling apart, and I'm holding them together with shoelaces. And I, this is like a blur to me because it was really a weird time in my life. I remember I ended up going on general assistance. But I'm still going downward emotionally. And I realized on general assistance, you don't have enough money to drown yourself in the bottle. I was only able to do that like every two weeks, and I had to save up pennies to do it, till finally the bartender got sick of my envelope of pennies and started giving me free beers. <laughs> but I also had quarters. I was like that annoying drunk, and I would have at least six quarters. I'd put them in the jukebox, and I would play Sly and the Family Stones, Do You Want Me to Stay, back to back. <laughs> and I would just dance in the middle of the floor. And then for a while, I didn't realize why people didn't like me there. But I, I, it, it dawned on me later on, years later. So it was, I just got so despondent. And I'm like, I'm not getting anywhere. I had no job skills. And I'm just going down and down till finally, I'm like, I'm going to get this over with. I'm just going to take myself out. 
I could hear going up yonder, you know, as my soundtrack. Did y'all go to church? I didn't. I just know that from the radio. But anyway, <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to die. There's nothing for me here. And I'm like, how do I do this? Wow, I don't like blood and, and, and metal, you know? So I'm like, oh, I can suffocate myself. So I went out because I figured I better be drunk. Brought a, what's that, a pint of vodka? A clear plastic bag. They weren't illegal yet. <laughs> and so I got drunk, put the plastic bag over my head. I got one of those stimulations that was holding my hirachis together. Got one of those and tied them very neat. You can tell by my shoes. I tied a very neat knot around my neck. And I laid back. And I'm like, I'm ready to go. I am ready. And I closed my eyes. And all of a sudden, I went, <laughs> and I'm thinking, I can't breathe, you know? <laughs> and then I'm like, that's the whole point, you know? <laughs> you're trying to die here, you know? You know, you, you're on a mission. So I, I relaxed, and I'm just like, <laughs> and all of a sudden, there was a, and I'm thinking, the door, <laughs> there's someone at the door, and due to, Years of programming, <laughs> when someone knocks at the door, you answer it. <laughs> so I'm like, uh, uh. So, I'm like uh. so I tear off the plastic bag, and I realize now it was still around my neck. I open the door, and there's this cute little white guy, and he says, What you do? Hi, what you doing? I'm like, I'm trying to die. I'm trying to kill myself. And who are you? Oh, I'm so and so. And I brought you home from the party last night, which I have forgotten about the party. I, to this day, I don't remember that party. He brought me home. He brought other people home. He dropped me off. And he remembered me. I don't know why. I, I hadn't had children yet, so my bosoms were nothing to shout about. But he remembered me, and I said, I, you know, he said, I said, I'm trying to kill myself. And he said, really? I said, yes. So I said, come on in. <laughs> and I laid down, because I'm still drunk. So I laid down, and he sat on the end of the bed, and he kind of reached toward me, and then he went, nah, nah. <laughs> I'm like, good, because I ain't that drunk. <laughs> and he said, let's go to the beach. So he took me to Ocean Beach, and he brought me like barbecue chicken wings and cigarettes. I think I had a beer. It seemed I was like I remember a beer. <laughs> but we stayed there. All day, all the rest of that day, we stayed there. And he brought me home. And I thanked him. And all I remember of him, I to this day, I don't know his name. All I remember was his curly blonde hair and his big eyes that weren't blue. I'm really thinking they were brown. And he had this nice little white sports car convertible. That's what I remember. I remember him driving off. And I remember thinking later in my room, it was not my time to go. And years before that, because my life has been very unusual, I would ask myself, like, what are you, I didn't ask why am I here? But things would happen and I would ask the question, what are you saving me for? Like, what is it that I'm going to have to do that I have to be here? And that gave me some comfort. I tried it again, but that's another story. <laughs>